Welcome to the MIM Podcast. I'm Adam Norman, founder and CEO at MIM, where we're on a mission to create the best major incident managers in the world. At MIM, our clients range from the largest, most well-known companies through to new, innovative companies across almost every industry from more than 72 different countries. You're going to hear about the best practices, strategies and tactics, how companies deliver major instant management excellence, some of the challenges they face, and different views on major instant management from around the world, as well as how major instant management is constantly evolving. On this podcast, we go deeper, interviewing professionals from the community. Our hope is that you will leave this podcast with some new ideas and a greater passion for major instant performance. In this episode, I speak with Thomas Munson, NOC Manager at Box. We talk about major instant management from a NOC perspective, Thomas's passion for developing others, and moving from a large corporate culture to a startup culture. We hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Thomas. How are you doing? Hey, Adam. Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Very well, thank you. Very well, thank you. Um, thanks for coming on the show. Um, this is off the back of you speaking at the MIM Expo 2020, which, as I mentioned before the show, um, received some really good feedback. So thanks for that as well. But excited to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. And, uh, thanks for having me. Doing the expo talk was a it was a great experience. So, um, put me out of my comfort zone a little bit, so it's good to have good feedback. Yeah, it's an interesting one because you. I mean, you've been around. We'll, we'll get into. We'll, we'll talk a bit about you in a minute. But you've been around for a long time in this industry. But what's interesting is, particularly when you get into the major incident space, most people who are very accomplished in this space have never really spoken because the industry was so closed and. PR departments and legal departments just used to kind of say no, um, which has been interesting because this year's expo had something like double the number of speakers from the first year that we ran it. Um, so this was year two. So it's been really interesting. I mean, we've done a lot of work with, with people's legal departments to help them understand what it is. But um, yeah, it's been great. It's, it's been really good. So um, before we get into it anymore, just for people who don't know you, aren't familiar with, with you, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so um, Thomas Munson. I am currently a knock manager with Box. Um, I came through the apprenticeship scheme with BT Cellnet, as it was called back then, who are now O2. Um, so I haven't had a real like, a conventional route into the SaaS world. Um, came through telecoms, uh, worked my way through tools, and then um, into management. Like, my path, uh, my career path crossed over between management and engineering a couple of times before I became a NOC manager um, or SPMC duty manager as Telefonica 02 called it then. Um, and then in 2019, at the beginning, there was an opportunity to move across to Box, um, change of career, change of pace, um, change of industry. Uh, it was massively exciting for me, uh, Silicon Valley company. Um, so I moved across 2019. So all in all, I have around uh, 20 years experience in the working alongside major instant at least, um, but 20 years experience in, in the NOC. Yeah, big, big, big part of major instance, the, the NOC. Um, yeah. So, yeah, sure. yeah, just a bit. Um, so, it's so a really interesting. Um, I can see, yeah, I can absolutely see the draw to kind of a VC funded. Um, scale up, they're not a startup, much more substantial than that. Um, but, um, but one of the more modern companies that you see coming through, disrupting and, and really empowering the way people are working. Um, for people who aren't familiar, do you want to give them a bit of a, a rundown on Box? Yeah, so Box is a cloud content management company. Um, so our mission statement is to power the way the world works. Uh, so really it's around collaboration, um, We've got best of breed um, partner integrations with Box, so like Google, Microsoft, um, Slack, Zoom, you know, the best of breed enterprise grade tools all integrate with Box. And the idea really is that with the, the Box um, product, you can do all of your work without having to leave the environment too much uh, and do it 
wherever you are in the world. Um, so, and keep that continuous um, work going with that collaboration with your peers, with your teams, and also with your customers. So one of the use cases, for example, could be a surgeon in operation theatre. He's um, got all of his operation cut and the medical notes for that particular patient. Or like um, an insurance uh, a teller could be out and surveying a claim and they can take pictures, send it back to the office, get decisions straight away for the customer. Uh, so th and also another use case, uh, we have a lot of universities. So they're storing their research data with Box, um, but they're also able to collaborate with other uh, like-minded people around the world. So it's lots of good use cases much more than a storage company <laughs> yeah i mean it's, it's interesting isn't it the shift to that at least for me feels pretty seamless in that i know it was a very gradual thing in that the, the way the world worked in terms of wanting to work like that but now that we're there it feels like it happened without me quite realizing and we just take it for granted now that that is the way we all work i mean i imagine obviously doing great things before, but obviously COVID for a lot of companies has really sped that up um, in getting rid of perhaps some legacy systems and ways of doing things. So I imagine, yeah, it's been, been really interesting. So, okay. Um, in terms of um, in terms of the company, what sort of um, enterprise customers do you work with? Uh, so some fairly large customers. Um, so we have like General Electric, uh, Department of Justice in the US, Coca-Cola, um, a couple of the UK ones like the Met Police, um, a big partner. Um, so some big names in there, big labels. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm I'm not surprised, but okay. So um, tell me about, it's interesting because we were talking before the show about different types of companies and lots of companies um, use terms like agile and they talk about flat hierarchies and structures and, and being able to get work done and, and perhaps getting out of their own way. I think companies like Box um, actually live that though. I think it's really interesting to see that. What um, obviously I know that that's accurate just because we've spoken before and you said actually no really flat hierarchy structure really good at letting people get on and get good work done. Um, what sort of impact has that had for you going to a company like that? What's the difference? Is it is it really noticeable? Yeah, it's very palpable. Really, see, I've come from um, like the years of history at Telefonica. You know, it's just O2 or BT Cellnet's is old BT hierarchy. Um, very well structured, like it's a very well run um, business, but I mean, there is still some bureaucracy. Um, they were moving away from bureaucracy when, when I left Telefonica, I'm sure they've gone a long way since then as well. Um, but yeah, years of history with BT and, and Telefonica. So processes are, are kind of well ingrained. Um, in bots, we're still developing the processes. It's a, an ongoing um, evolution and it will never stop. Um, because that's the way that we want to develop. We want to be on the cutting edge of uh, technology. So you have to keep that agile mindset of, of developing. Um, but, I mean, am I allowed to swear, Adam? Uh, it's only one <laughs> word. It's a very small one. Go for it. <laughs> okay, so um, one of our – I'll, I'll adapt it for the audience. Okay, so one of our, uh, our values is quite literally uh, get stuff done, fail fast, take risks. Um, so it's that – it is a blameless culture. So – uh, what I ask of my engineers is they only make mistakes once and learn from it. But it really is that autonomy is kind of drilled into you from day one that uh, you are an owner. Another one of our, our values is be an owner. You are an owner, quite literally. Um, so go there, go out, get it done, take risks, fail fast, um, learn from it if it goes wrong. But that, and that's the, the agile mindset that, that we kind of like to, to run with at Box. So it's, it's a much faster pace than Telefonica. Um, greater opportunity to kind of put your stamp on things and to make a difference and to be heard. Um, and also collaboration across teams and across organisations. It's a lot easier um, to make contact, build relationships than at Telefonica. Um, main, one of the main reasons is at Telefonica, you, you wouldn't necessarily know what another team did 
um, or who the right person was to speak to. But like use, making use of Slack, um, like we can get a response almost instantly from somebody and if they don't know, they point you in the direction quite quickly. And everyone's quite acceptable to being approached. So It's interesting. I often wonder the size of an organisation definitely plays a part. There, there is just levels of governance that need to be in place for really big companies with huge and vast um, people. But I do sometimes wonder how much we lean on that. And I'm not talking about necessarily Telefonica. Obviously, I, I'm very privileged. We get to see lots of different companies um, all over the world and hear very similar stories about really large, particularly like what we consider institutions, of how much of that genuinely is certain things have to be in place because there are so many people involved versus the legacy of actually we kind of slipped into this and we now just accept it and actually we could do it very differently. One of the nice things I think about a lot of um, scale-ups and more modern companies or, or were created um, more recently is that people really do tend to live and breathe that empowerment and it normally comes from f having worked at large organisations that were either bureaucratic or it was just very difficult to get work done. They're just fed up of it and they understand it's a blocker. Um, and even as those companies get bigger, I'm yet to see many of those companies become overly cumbersome with process or too much governance that gets in the way. So it does leave me feeling, um, it does leave me feeling that perhaps... Um, it's not all down to size and, and some of these institutions. It is just culture that's been built and accepted. But re really interesting to, to hear. Yeah, re really, really interesting to hear. So um, how how does Box run major incidents? Do you have an established team? Um, is it engineer-led? What's the setup there? Yeah, so I mean, I, I talked a little bit about this in my expo talk. Um, one of the things that Telefonica does really well is major incident management. Is I mean, lots of things they do really well, um, but yeah, major incident management is a, a really well run um, organization there. So um, the the MIMS kind of they are industry experts at Telefonica, um, so they drive incidents really well. And obviously, with like Ofcom, um, the regulations around Ofcom, they they have to do it that well. And, and they have a large resource that they throw at that to make sure that they um, do everything they can for their customer and also to make sure they're meeting regula regulatory needs. Um, with Box, like, also, we um, like the, the mission statement of um, the NOC is to protect the customer experience always. So um, we are just as invested in making sure that we uh, minimise the amount of downtime as much as we can. Um, but the, I guess the major difference is that we don't have the massive resource that you would have at a larger institution. Um, but also it's because we work closely with the subject matter experts. So like we have this concept of service owners. Um, it's, it's a microservice. But the way that we run things is as microservices. So um, the service owners play a, a large part of the instant process. But the actual instant process is engineer-led. We use um, engineers with uh, job titles of TDOs, technical duty officers. Um, and so in our world, uh, TDOs are the major instant managers. They're the expert in process. They also have a very good technical understanding of the architecture and the infrastructure. And they have really good um, relationships built with the service owners. So during a, um, a major incident, they'll be the ones that are driving to direct cause, to remediate the direct cause and mitigate um, to minimise the amount of downtime. Um, whilst we also have the service owners who are looking to, but sometimes you have to keep them in check because they, as engineers, they want to kind of fix the root cause. So we have to keep them in check for the direct cause so that we can mitigate as quickly as we can. But it's, it's a real partnership. It's a very collaborative approach to major incidents. Okay, interesting. So... I've got a couple of questions actually on that. So um, your technical duty officers, do they do? Do they essentially have a day job? Is it dual role for them or is that all they do? So they're kind of like, um, yeah, you think of them as like the, um, a firefighter on call, ready to pounce at any, any moment. But because of that, they need to be um, constantly in training to ensure their muscle memory is there and ready to, to, to go in an instant. So, 
the day to day, they'll be um, building those relationships with service owners. They'll be digging into um, architecture a little bit more, working closely with problem management to understand like what are the current triggers that we're looking at, the investigations. They play a, a large part in the, the CAD process for Box. So they're making sure they're on top of all the changes, um, upcoming and previous as well, um, looking at like success rate, that kind of thing. And also they, there's a lot of integration with our, um, we have this concept of MOD, manager on duty. So that is a, a knock engineer who for their uh, shift, they're the manager of box.com. They're the manager of protecting the customer experience. Um, so really they are the ones that, they're the ones that say we're now an instant or they're the ones that say, okay, we're out of instant, everything's fine. And they're also looking into like the, the small degradation to service that could lead to bigger things. But so there's a, a good relationship there between the TDO and the MOD um, constantly in communication throughout the day. Okay, so so it sounds like it's it's still like a dedicated role. So if I appreciate it slightly different, but if we were to call them major instant managers, it would be a dedicated role. Essentially, that's what they function on. It's just by the nature of it sounds like Box, and I'll ask you this in a moment, um, is, is like a lot of more modern companies. You have much newer systems and infrastructure, and having been built mostly um, cloud-based, it's far easier and you have less downtime than a lot of legacy systems and, and very large companies that just have huge volumes of major incidents that literally you have an on-duty major incident manager and they almost don't stop. They're just getting through major incident after major incident. So it sounds, it does sound like it's a dedicated role. Is that right? It's a dedicated role, yeah. Um, it's, it's not a, a, f- a fluid role. It's a constant um, yeah, obviously, I can't go into the amount of the, the volumes of issues that we, we go through, but it is technology. Uh, it, it does fail. It will fail. It's inevitable. It's like taxes and death. Um, so, <laughs> Isn't it <yeah>. just? <laughs> but at the end of the day, that's why we're here. Um, we're there to make sure it's as minimal as, that, as possible to mitigate any risks um, and also to get the customer back up as quick as possible. That that's that's really encouraging to hear, though. Because what's interesting, and you will have seen this as well, is you find with a lot of modern companies who do invest heavily on very good infrastructure and systems that because they do that, they lean more heavily into the SRE methodology, and they do stay away from having dedicated resources to do this, which I always find quite strange because I think well, actually. Yes, but in the more modern companies, downtime can often be more severe, and that is your your core offering. Anything that goes down is typically customer facing for those types of companies. So I always find it strange that they lean away from a more traditional model of major instant management. But it sounds like you guys have, have absolutely nailed that and have dedicated resources focusing on it. Okay, interesting. So um, from not necessarily just in not necessarily just in in box. Oh, sorry. So, how many um, technical duty officers do you tend to have? Any idea? Uh, so, we've just gone through a recruitment process. So, we're um, our second TDO is about to join us. Um, it should be within the next month. So, we currently have one. We're moving to two. Um, and if the model is um, as successful as we're expecting it to be, then we'd look to have a further, a third, fourth, see how we can go. Um, in the absence of a TDO, then the MOD uh, would step up and they would be the instant commander. Um, so it's, I, I guess the slight difference is, is the, um, the MODs are usually uh, slightly more junior in their experience, whereas the TDO function is a very experienced um, role. Um, so the people that we have in there have been doing it for a long time. And obviously, we, we understand there's got to be a starting point. You've got to give someone a break at some point. Um, and that's what we're doing with our MODs. We're, we're training them up to get them to that point so that when a TDO position becomes available, that they're well primed to, to drop into that space if that's the career path they want to take. Ah, we've got something interesting we've been working on. I'll share it with you um, after the podcast. But um, something you'll find interesting around that. So um, slightly cryptic, but you'll you'll understand. Um, So it's interesting because you mentioned as well that they're quite technical, so they're getting involved in the architecture. And do you ever find that to be a hindrance? Because there's there seems to be very divided opinion on should people running major instance be technical? 
should they purely focus on the leadership and leverage the um, brain power of dedicated SMEs for each specialty. Um, so I'm always interested to hear when you do have people who have reasonable technical capabilities in those roles, how people find it. What's What's been your experience of that? Um, yeah, I, I can see why it would be um, a negative potentially, but so something that we drill into our engineers is the trust but verify mindset. You know, the idea of the five whys. Keep asking the why until you understand it. Um, when you have somebody with a, a good technical understanding already, um, the five whys become two whys, and then you move on. So it, it's um, if we were to say the service owner to the service owner, you are in charge of um, remediating this issue um, they would go straight to root cause analysis they they want to just keep engineering the shit out but sorry <laughs> I should have just it's so, look, so no no look look um it's the it's the real world we absolutely anyone who watches this podcast and works in this space has definitely heard some bad language um, yeah, at some yeah, point sure. because of the situations <laughs> we're nearly dealing with so look it's the real world don't worry it's fine but yeah i mean they would typically engineers want to fix things that's 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 why I became an engineer. I wanted to fix things, and um, and they're no different. Like whether you're a build engineer or a reliability engineer, you want to fix things. Um, so yeah, I, they will just try to over engineer it um, to the point of root cause, and it would just be wasted time for the customer experience. So um, a, a TDO with that good technical understanding is able to understand what they're being told. Um, which is key when you're doing instant communication because then they can translate it to the stakeholders in layman's terms. Um, so it's not all just jargon, uh, but also they can tell when a service owner is trying to just get things moving and they're not necessarily being 100% accurate with what they're telling us. Um, so then we can ask further whys, uh, if that makes sense. No, no, it makes makes perfect sense. I think as well, I definitely think that it depends on the organization. So I used to be very firmly in the camp of no. Yeah, of course, you need an understanding of the infrastructure and there's definitely some basic knowledge that you need to have. Um, But I just used to feel like anyone who started to move to slightly more technical areas almost slow down investigations. What I think now is it massively depends on the organization, in particular the size of the organization. So if you're a company that ends up with, which we work with quite a few, who have maybe 50 or 100 people on a bridge call, which is definitely too many anyway. Um, But if you have that, that's where it becomes a real problem. When you're working with smaller numbers and in much more tightly knit groups of people who you get to know quite well, I think you can get away with it a lot more. And in some cases, that can actually be an asset, but it still depends on the person. And they've, I mean, you obviously get it very well. They have to be self aware enough to recognize when they're doing that. Um, so I think it, it depends. So very interesting. Okay. So, um, can you talk about the, the tools you guys use when you have major incidents? Is there a, a major instant tool stack you have there that you use? Uh, not so much, really. It's uh, about whatever can get the, t- the job done. I guess our main communication piece is Slack. Um, we have a dedicated instant channel that we do all our communications in there. So we've got our audit trail for when we're doing a post-mortem. Um, and also, sorry, it's not a post-mortem um, item, is it? <laughs> just just remembered. Uh, so post-mortem is essentially our um, like a post-instant review. Um, so it's detailing like root cause analysis, timelines, that kind of thing. But it's just slightly different terminology. Led by a um, licensed yeah. coroner. Look, we're not, <laughs> look we're, 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 we're not precious here. I'm definitely not um, idle, please. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> there's, well, there's such yeah. a blend now. I think it's really interesting. You've seen a lot of organizations still leaning very heavily into ITIL. And I know particularly earlier in my career, so about a decade and a half ago, I thought it was incredible for foundations. But obviously, as you see the rise of various other frameworks, methodologies working, the more I'm convinced that leaning too heavily into just one framework is the wrong thing. Um, and I think frameworks trying to be all things to all people are going to fail miserably because the world just isn't working like that anymore. Um, I think ITIL did a great job in their update recently as well about recognising 
that we're here to create value, more so in previous frameworks. But there's just it's such a long period between when we when we get updates in, in a lot of the larger frameworks that you find you get halfway through and it's not obsolete, it's absolutely the wrong words, it's not still very valuable, but it's um, not quite keeping pace with how quickly the world's changing now. And so I almost feel like if a lot of the frameworks like that and perhaps some slightly different approaches were just to update more frequently and do smaller updates, we'd stay, we'd keep pace. Um, the, the terminology one's a really interesting one, though, because I find one of the biggest challenges you've got at the moment is there's been a bit of a an arms race almost with software companies trying to serve this market, particularly in incident space more than major incident, but also cybersecurity. And cybersecurity in particular has been guilty those companies of marketing personnel who don't really understand our industry taking service level knowledge and um, to completely confusing everybody. So you go on there and they've got some incredible resources, but the terms they use are, they use things interchangeably, which are not interchangeable. Um, and they use terms which aren't currently used. But if you didn't know any better and you were coming to that, and this is a useful resource, you start walking around using it. And so it almost defeats the purpose of all of us having any kind of common language. And it looks to me anyway, it, um, cybersecurity in particular, all these companies who have had a bit of a gold rush in, in trying to sell to companies have completely confused things with their content marketing. Um, so yeah, look, we're not, we're not, um, we're not terminology precious here at all. You, you call things whatever you want, um, as, especially if it gets the job done. So, okay. So Slack really interesting. Cause I know there's, there's a few clients we work with who have started using Slack, some who are using it already. I know Slack were interested in moving in this space. Obviously they announced, um, um, they were being acquired, um, was it last week. Um, so they announced the acquisition, which was yeah by Salesforce, which is really interesting. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes because it, it, from an outsider's point of view, what I can see, the way Salesforce wants to use it within their own platform almost looks slightly differently from how Slack is currently positioned. And maybe I've completely got that wrong. But I thought, oh, that'd be interesting to see how people keep using it in the instant space. Um, so do you use anything else? Do you use like status pages or any kind of portal for, for your end users? Yeah, so um, we have uh, status.fox.com. Um, so we we keep that updated with current status and previous uh, updates, like um, public post-mortems, um, uh, public responses, I guess. It's not post-mortems, so definitely it's labeled like that. But yeah, we have that. We use um, Zoom for our instant bridges um we used to have a, when we were all in the office we had this nice uh physical war room with whiteboards and uh, laminated labels and things like that so we could do our uh, swim lanes but yeah now we have we have zoom um i, I gotta admit breakout rooms are a little bit harder to keep control of than swim lanes but um yeah so we use that uh what else do we use so we have look, Got a very good partnership with PagerDuty for our alerting. Um, so that's that's a, a very vital tool for us, PagerDuty. Uh, but it's it's all about that kind of. We, we partner with enterprise grade, like best best of breed tools, really, uh, and that's really where we feel we're going to get the most benefit from partnering with each other. Um, so like the the announcement for Slack was a huge success for Box, not because we're invested in them, but what it means for the SaaS industry and uh, for that space. It's like they haven't been gobbled up by a huge conglomerate. They've been gobbled up by, <laughs> gobbled up, they've, they've been acquired um, to kind of further that SaaS, that SaaS space and show that, you know, best debris can come from anywhere. Um, so that's, that's like why it was a, a huge celebration at bots when that was announced for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a really interesting acquisition. It'll be really interesting to see what happens. So, um, see, I'm, I'm a fan of Slack. I, I do actually really rate it as a tool. Um, my only selfish want, and we're a much smaller market, so I can see why, I, I would have wanted some 
um, customizations that very much focused on instant management, which I appreciate Slack's so much bigger than just our world. So um, why would they just do what I want? But it was interesting because I really like it as a tool. Um, and I thought with some, some minor adjustments as an instant command tool, I thought it'd be really, really strong um, and just help it help it, um, up a few levels. But yeah, re- really interesting, particularly an acquisition at this particular time in the world when there's a lot of chaos going on, I thought it was pretty cool. But um, okay, so you mentioned Page Duty, um, really strong for you guys. Obviously, they actually just um, sponsored the Expo, um, the 2020 Expo, and they're doing a lot of really interesting things in this space at the moment. They work with a lot of our current clients, and I, I know they're um, looking to work with more, but it's interesting. So another company they IPO'd, I think it was last year, um, maybe this year actually. But um, another exciting thing about a company securing more and more resources that's doing really good work in this space, um, another really encouraging thing. But it is interesting because um, it does seem like there's started to be a lot more attention on this space from SaaS companies, um, and hopefully that 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 just further um, further improves things. So, when you said you've got the the status page, is, it, is that Atlassian? Is that another supplier? Uh, I I can't remember to be honest with you. No worries. There are yeah no there's a, there's a few few companies popping up at the moment doing status pages. I know Atlassian's um, one of the older ones that's, that's had it for quite a while. Um, I know quite a few companies use, but I, I really rate rate a good status page as well. I think particularly on the consumer end, the option to just go in and see those updates is a real improvement in the way we communicate with end consumers um, or smaller business. So, okay, really interesting. Well, something we do do with our status page, um, I think it is Atlassian. We we do use Jira Confluence, um, so I'm pretty sure it is. But something we do do is like we group our statuses by the product, um, so you can see what services support the product as a customer, and also you can see the status of those individual services. And there's a lot of crossovers between the products, so. Um, we do give a lot of information to our customers to try and give them the best idea as possible. The worst thing is for them to find out through, I don't know, Down Detector or Twitter. Oh, yeah. I mean, someone other than you guys. Yeah, of course. Of course. That's really interesting that you actually give them that extra level of detail. I quite like that. That's, um, yeah, to actually show them under- underpinning services. Okay, very interesting. So let's talk about the knock. How how do you see the role of the knock through? I mean, it was seventeen years, wasn't it? You were O two Telefonica, and and you've been at Box yeah. coming up uh, eighteen. You're coming coming on for two years at, at Box. How do you in, in all that experience? You will have seen many major incidents. How do you see the role of the knock? Um, fit, <laughs> probably too many. Um, how do you see the role of the knock fitting in with with modern major instant management? What what do you see the knock brings to the party? Yeah, it's an interesting one, especially so in this like CS world that I'm in now. Um, it's it's a completely different view on instant management. Um, so we we do have you asked earlier about our our stack for our instant process, and we do have some internal tools that we've built ourselves. So we're hiring like really talented individuals that are interested in like so many different career paths. Like they want to be DevOps, they want to be SRE, they want to be a TDA, they want to be an instant manager. There's, so that means that we have an opportunity then to use those kind of ideas and the energy to come up with some really cool tools. Um, so like a couple of things we've built is like a instant command center, it's an internal thing that we use that where we can orchestrate all of our communications, like it's templated, um, it integrates with Jira or with Slack. Um, it, even we can get like integrations from PagerDuty and there with API calls and webhooks and yeah, so like things like that. It's just the guys are thinking about that or like um uh a one dashboard so that it can bring all of our features together so that we can do um, remediation tasks at a push of a button so things like that so the way that i see it going is um using that kind of uh that kind of expertise i guess to develop tools that a- enable us to mitigate quicker so then we can then focus on 
the cause afterwards and be a bigger part of that. And something we're trying to do with our engineers is, um, and again, this is a constant evolution because we're going to have churn, we're going to have new eyes, we're going to be able to build out the team, hopefully. Um, so a constant that we're working on is getting them to have the experience working with different services so that they have that experience to be able to react in an instant rather than having to engage in on-call, for example. So we'll be able to do that first fix, and then we'll just be giving the service owners the information of what went wrong, how we fixed it, uh, now you can go and do your root cause. Um, another thing we're looking to do is to build their incident commander ability as well. So expose them to the major incidents and expose them to these like hectic calls. Like we're doing tabletop exercises all the time as well. So we're trying to promote that muscle memory. Um, so I've, I've, I don't know if I've answered your question, Anne, but essentially I think it's like this evolution to this hybrid of um, like highly skilled engineers being able to lead instances uh, if they need to at all. Okay, no, inter- no, really interesting. Interesting to hear about the development internally. That's actually becoming more common. Um, it used to be there was probably a handful of companies that were going down that route, and it actually seems to become more common because people are so specific in their needs at each company. Um, and they have the, the talented resource internally that they'll just build out elements themselves. Um, but, it, yeah, it's interesting, very interesting. So for you, being the NOC manager, what's, what's your biggest frustration um, when dealing with major incidents throughout your career um, from a NOC perspective? Is there anything that major incident managers do that really frustrate you? Is there anything they do well that actually um, makes your life a lot more easy? Oh, good question. Um, so I'd say my time with Telefonica, one of the things that really irritated me was having to answer the same question more than once, um, particularly because they, they were experts in instant management and not necessarily the infrastructure. So it was a lot of technical questions. But the good ones were the ones that picked it up. They didn't have to ask you twice. They understood it. Um, or they, they had enough of an understanding that they could build on that. Um, so having to yeah, reiterate is, is quite frustrating. But I, I've got to be careful that I don't say that too much because I, I feel like I'm probably doing the same with the service owners right now. So my understanding is not there, not there yet. So they probably get frustrated with me <laughs> equally. Um, I, the other frustration is a huge frustration and it's going to be common across the industry is um, just the amount of changes that go wrong. That's really annoying. Like, I mean, even... <laughs> We have solid cabs, we have solid like change control, we have a very good risk assessment and still things get through. And I mean, it is the nature of the beast and that's why we exist, but it is frustrating. Yeah, so um, last reporting was something like 70% of major incidents were still caused by change. And that's a mixture, by the way, so some of that's authorised, some, some's not. Um, and yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that that is so painful but you can we're going to have to collectively as an industry we're definitely going to have to get better um at that otherwise it's going to get worse you see the speed of change and the rate of change and you look at methodologies coming through now where it's trying to build in more speed and more velocity around changes so you can only see that becoming more of a problem. And, yeah, you're right, even very good, robust, well-structured, well-managed change um, change functions are still having a problem with that. It's a really common thing that we see with people. But we're definitely, as an industry, going to have to figure out how to, how to deal with that more effectively, or it's only going to get worse. The cost of dealing with them as well must be horrendous for organisations. If you tallied up, um, cost of resource to fix, mobilising um, a whole team of engineers for every change that goes wrong. Um, there's probably a pretty good business case of whatever the solution may be of a large chunk of money paying for itself, um, essentially, with that solution. Uh, okay, very interesting. So what what the major instant managers do well that you really like and, and makes your life easier from a not perspective? Uh, so... 
with the um, major instance managers at um, Telefonica and also with the TDOs, what they do really well is they keep the, the conversation moving forwards and they keep it on track. Um, so sometimes you might have uh, somebody come up with a theory that's a bit left field or um, constant interruptions, that kind of thing. They, they can just cut all that out and they just keep everything moving forward. Um, it, uh, like ignoring all the uh, interference, if you like. I think that's a real key asset for a good major instant manager is to be able to um, just to zone, keep keep in the zone, keep everything moving, everything moving forward, stay focused on the end goal. I think. Um, I say for us, it's minimal amount of down. Well, for everyone, it's minimal amount of downtime, isn't it? And so, yeah, yeah, I I agree though. Having that singular focus and that pursuit and the ability to to get rid of the noise, particularly. Um, when there's a lot of it going on and there's perhaps disruption, you've got your own people within your own organisation who aren't necessarily going to contribute to the, the technical resolution, getting involved. And, yeah, it's definitely um, definitely a real asset. I think um, it's interesting. I think you probably you alluded to this, but perhaps because of that, you haven't necessarily um, spent a lot of time thinking about it. I think one of the other things that I've always thought is really valuable is when people take the time prior to there being a major incident to form some kind of relationship, particularly with people from the NOC. Um, one of the worst things I used to see, one of the worst crimes, is someone who spent no time not even to introduce themselves and also has quite an um, authoritarian style of leadership um, come in and be really quite direct with people who they have no relationship with I always find quite interesting um, which again tends to be really large older institutions tend to be more of an approach particularly with higher turnover of staff because technical resources are always moving on and it is going to be harder to get to know people and a lot of people say in those organisations well I haven't got time I'm so busy it's like well this needs to be fed back into your management. There has to be time to build these relationships. It completely changes your downtime um, and how quickly you can resolve an incident. But okay, really interesting. Thank you very much. So um, take note, people. This is from a knock perspective. Um, this, this is what frustrates them. Um, this is what re really helps. Um, I just, can I just add something to that, Adam? So something um, you and I had talked about previously was um, like, what is a major incident manager at the heart of it, what are they? And we talked about this notion of what they what they are are leaders. They're there to provide leadership, and, and quite often that's that part of it's overlooked. And so when you think about um, like what is a leader, like what is the definition of a leader? And I know there's there's probably lots of books written on it and lots of different theories, but essentially it's somebody that can influence somebody else to be able to follow them into whatever the, the task or objective is. And so, like you were saying, building those relationships is key to leadership. Like, if you haven't got a leadership, why should they follow you? A relationship, why, why should they follow you? So, yeah, I think that's, that's really key what you were saying there. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah, so we, we have talked about this before. It's really interesting in the global best practice in IT agents and management, the, the leadership tech section, we're obviously leading to heavily. But there's one bit where we talk about leadership v management and not in the sense of one is better than the other because you absolutely need both in all kinds of organisations. Um, and some people have both, so it's not even that they are necessarily two separate people. But when you have a management hat on, you're trying to run systems in the same way you think in a very systematic, structured way and you consider the past very frequently. Um, but in terms of in a more black and white sense, Managers have carrots and sticks, or at least in the traditional model of like they have employees. Leaders have followers, and you can't force people to follow your leadership. Um, there are ways that you can get them to do things which aren't particularly pleasant, and nobody wants to take that route, or they shouldn't do anyway. But I think it's interesting. So I always think about leaders and their ability to inspire. So you were saying like trying to get people who want to follow their leadership. Most of that comes from inspiration and most of that then comes right back to the individual in terms of um, their personal brand so whether it's their character their values how they treat other people their ability to stay focused on mission whilst involving others all these things you kind of line up and you realize 
when you look at the best versions of major instant managers and high pressure situations, you realize that it's way more than just their work style. It's a character thing. So it's interesting. If someone were to go onto your, I know this because um, we it, it was a while ago when we connected, but I remember seeing your LinkedIn and seeing comments from people who had previously worked for you about um, your character and how good you were to work for and how you made the team feel really safe, secure, and, and gave them the rest. freedom to, <laughs> <laughs> to experiment. No, but that's, that's a big thing. I mean, particularly in a world now where people just, particularly on things like LinkedIn, they kind of put whatever and it's almost like a do favors people. You had some quite quite deeply appreciative comments on there about your leadership. Um, it's one of the reasons we, we started speaking and we don't just invite anyone on the show. It's very obvious in your style. And I think it's really interesting people getting into major instant management, see all of the skills and the models that we can teach, but there is definitely this underlying thing around character um, which taps very deeply into the heart of that leadership and, and being able to inspire others to follow you instead of thinking carrot stick, traditional um, slightly antiquated methods but yeah it's, it's really interesting and I think it's like I say the best best ones it's more than just about what they do it's a whole character it's a way of being and, and you trust them um, and and it, yeah that's 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 takes a lot of work in relationships to trust people um, so let's talk a bit more about you let's talk about um, your career so what was your very first ever job so not corporate job you mentioned you were an apprentice. Had you done anything before that? Uh, so that was straight from school. So I guess my first paper round, I was, what, nine years old, I guess. That was my first paid-for job um, because my, my sister had a paper round that she didn't want to do. So she gave me half her money for me to finish the round for her. She's very generous of her. Um, but actually what that, what that taught me was... Like, so you know, hang on, did she... Did she do any of it or did she just give you yeah. half the money for you to go and do it? Yeah. That's really entrepreneurial. I like that. So essentially she was your boss and she did none of the work but still took half the money. Okay, very cool. So my my sister is easily one of the cleverest people I know. She's very smart, very switched on. Um, but she had me over on that one. Like, <laughs> so. Hey, no, look, you, 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 you wanted to do the work. You knew, you knew the amount she was paying. That's fair. I think that's genius. Um, that's really impressive. I was very willing at that point. Yeah. But, but so, so what that taught me was that, you know, you, you do something, you get paid. Um, and then with that, you can then make do something nice for yourself. Even at that, yeah, like it was probably football stickers at the time or something like that or bubble gum I had a habit for um <laughs> but so from there I just I just worked everything any opportunity I could so I was in a kitchen at 11 which was underage but my mum and dad were happy for me to do it at the time and 13 I was working in kitchens doing like waitering still doing paper rounds two paper rounds a day plus the free one on the weekend um um, but yeah, I, my dad used to work for O2. He used to take us into the office in the summer holidays. It was, oh, sorry, it's BT Cellnet. It was in the days where you could take children in, not have to sign off on uh, health and safety, do risk assessments. Uh, me and my sister would do like cups of tea for people, we'd do photocopy and filing. But it kind of, ex and he used to take us around to the, when he used to go around to the base sites, because he was a base site manager at the time. So we'd go and see these massive antennas. And we go into like the, the the console rooms, which were like air conditioning was on full blast, um, lots of flashing lights, cool looking machinery, and you're thinking, yeah, I, I like this. So it's kind of it was a bit of a father and son trade, I guess. Um, I definitely never got to emulate my dad's um, skill level. Um, he was an expert in his field, um, so. Yeah, I mean, he's up here. I'm, I'm still here somewhere. But he definitely gave me the bug. Um, so when the opportunity to join as an apprentice came up, I, I kind of grasped it, really. It's something I, I definitely wanted to do. And I'm not really one for um, t for sitting down and reading textbooks and doing exams. So I knew that this was the path for me. It was a, a, an opportunity to gain experience whilst also earning money and then potentially building a, a decent career for myself. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. I think the world's waking up to the fact that there are people who learn very differently 
and by getting hands on and doing, um, and just because they've taken that part as a path that I chose as well, um, that it doesn't mean that it's any better or worse than, than going more a more traditional academic route. Um, it seems like the world's woken up a bit, but yeah, no, I'm I'm the same. I like to get hands on with things, and that's typically how I'll understand them. If you purely just got me to read a book um, and then regurgitate it, and let, it, that's it, funnily enough, if it were a business book, I, I'm slightly odd. If you gave me a fiction book, I could sit there and read the same paragraph over and over again, and I would struggle maybe ten times, and I'd struggle to tell you what that said. I just have a bit of a hole in my brain. I can regurgitate pages of certain business books that I read though on say business model creation or, or whatever for that I haven't read in like six, seven years, if not longer. Um so yeah, we're we're all we're all pretty unique in that. Interesting that you said about the service stuff though, about making tea and working in kitchens. Um I find some of the best professionals I've ever met always did service jobs as a youngster. Because it's it's hard work and it's pretty pretty thankless and it also, you get loads of experience in dealing with people at all sorts of states. Um, usually in service, there's definitely a fair few unhappy ones in there too. So I think if you get that exposure as, as a youngster, it really adds something. Um, I did, you'll remember this because we're, we're around about the same age, but um, I would have been what, like 16, I think, when Starbucks, may, maybe sit when Starbucks came to the UK for the first time. And I um, I worked um, in a Starbucks. And what was interesting was um, no one had paid more than about a pound for a coffee for a very long time, let alone like three three pound ninety for a large coffee. No one understood sizing. It was attached to a Sainsbury's, and um, and so the the predominant trade was people who just wanted a cheap cup of tea and sit down. And also weren't used to waiting for it. So we literally had these queues going out the door of people who were very unhappy to be paying large amounts of money for something they didn't quite yet understand, um, which obviously shifted. We all love a good Starbucks now. Um, but but it was really interesting doing that. And it was I was on my feet all day. I was really, really busy. And it definitely, I thought I had a good work ethic anyway, but it definitely taught me a whole new level of work ethic and dealing with a number of people who didn't quite get what we were doing at the time um, gave me a really good grounding in, in people. Um, I definitely don't think I perhaps would have um, had the career that I've had without doing roles like that. I think there's really something to it. Um, yeah, I often think about that. I definitely agree. I think having exposure to... So um, I, I talked quite a lot about the customer experience in my expo talk as well. Um, it's obviously having a service role, you, you do get great exposure to customer experience, like good and positives. Um, so I, I worked in Little Chef for for quite a while, me and my sister, for a couple of years. So we were definitely exposed to a lot of negative feedback working in Little Chef because um, of the business model. But it was fun. Uh, and there was regular customers that you would chat and talk to, like, Come out, come out on a Saturday morning every every Saturday for their cup of tea and Olympic breakfast, um, and you, you got to to chat to them, and eventually they'd end up tipping you quite heavily, and you'd always get a Christmas tip, that kind of thing. But you, you start to build. I, I'm a very tactile person, very sociable. Um, I love people. Um, I, I love meeting different types of people. But I do think that variety is a spice of life, and it's what keeps me going. So. It, but it all stems from from those early, like you were saying, just chatting to people, getting to know people. Like you'd talk to a, a trucker at one table, and the next table there'd be like a family on the way to holiday and things like that. So it's a definitely a um, valuable time. My my um my daughter's only three, so I won't quite be pushing her into into the service world just yet. But um, I really it, it's definitely an aspiration of mine for her when she first starts in the working world, that she goes through some really quite hard service-based jobs just to get a real feel for it and understand it. And also to recognise how cushy we have it when we then end up a bit older in, in office-based jobs where, 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 yeah, we're perhaps using using our brain a lot. but um, We're still trying to please someone, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, Little Chef, do you remember the fondues that they used to do? 
do you remember they, they used to do a chocolate fondue that you would dip fruit into? So I would have been a youngster because I remember being on like family road trips and having that with my, my older sister. So do you remember their fondues? So I remember the breakfast well Baking. as well. Yeah, they used to these incredible fondues. Um, anyway, so... Um, <laughs> Of tension, they're so bad. <laughs> Just thinking about food. Um, <laughs> so, um, in order to to be where you are today, do you think that you've given anything up in terms of getting to where you are and, and doing what you've done? Well, personally or professionally, or both. Um, yeah. So, in the early days, um, as an engineer, it, I was on shift. Um, so it's week on week off, which sounds like great to have a week off, but um, it's a marathon. That those seven days are really long, uh, seven twelve-hour days or seven twelve-hour nights. Um, so come Monday, Tuesday of the next week, you you are absolutely shattered. And the older you get, the longer it takes to get over. <laughs> um, but it just it did mess with my social life. So quite often your friends don't really understand why you can't come out on a Saturday night. Um, I can come out every other Saturday, just not this one. But, uh, but also I, because I, I wanted to learn more, I would quite often do a lot of overtime as well. Um, I mean, the money was good, don't get me wrong, but it was a great opportunity to learn. So I do other functions rather than the function I was working in. So I, I started off on the radio function, then I moved into the core infrastructure then the value-added service infrastructure, uh, then into my management roles. And then I moved back into the radio function before I became the duty manager again. So um, it, it was a, a great opportunity. And like working night shift was the, the opportunity to learn. You could get to get involved in some major changes. Um, you would have some like major instance where you wouldn't have your own calls about, so you were the one in charge. Um, you could also like just... Get take loads of time to to read up and to learn and practice. Um, personally, so I mean, as a bit of personal and professional, I guess. But also, I, I was quite um, a budding footballer in my time as well. But that all kind of changed with with this. So I, I I could have been a a decent semi pro footballer if this hadn't have happened. But um, I look back on it and I don't see it with any regret. I think it, it happened for a reason. And um, father of three. Nice house, um, a nice job, beautiful wife. So that wouldn't have happened if my path had been different. I'm very thankful. I don't have regrets, Adam. Yeah. No, interesting. I, it's interesting, though, because I, I, you do find, particularly at a certain age, like it's it's hard work to progress your career and, and to achieve a certain level of success. And I don't think it's often talked about, which is interesting. And I think when you when you speak to people and you ask that question, um a lot of their initial responses no, and then they kind of have a think about it. Like, Actually, yeah, I, I probably have. I mean, yeah. So to run, I've been running companies since I was twenty something, and I was in and out of the corporate world um, for a while. But um, I, I pretty much gave up my twenties to, to learn how to run companies effectively, and to, and similar to yourself, have an incredible, incredible family, wife, nice house, and, and we do pretty well. Um, and it was really easy to forget what it took, particularly as it feels like so long ago now, like what it took to to move here. But it's always an interesting question. So um, have you got any interesting goals, either professionally or personally at the moment? Uh, so prof- uh, personally, I'm I'm studying for my Master's in Business Management. Um, okay. Two year, yeah, two-year part-time course. Um, just going into the – well, I'm halfway through the second module at the moment, so still early days, but – um that's not for anything there's no end goal for that it's just validation i just want to validate my knowledge in a certificate um professionally I'm not really too sure i just kind of want to learn as much as i can about my particular field um and yeah just see if how many people i can bring through the system with me so i'm really keen on developing people and seeing them grow and seeing them achieve so I think um, if I had an aspiration, it's to to really see the success of others. I I think I'm in a good place with my career. Um, I I feel like I've got a good balance of what I need to be fulfilled. 
Um, so now it's about how can I help others to achieve what they want to achieve? Um, and that, that gives me real satisfaction at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, it's re- really special seeing someone that you've worked with, particularly earlier in their career, and then seeing them like five, six, seven years on and seeing them having achieved some things they want. Yeah, it's definitely something special. Um, not something lots of people talk about as well, which is interesting because um, it is really fulfilling. But not not so many people talk about that. So, okay, what um, what's the biggest risk you've ever taken as a leader in your professional career? If you can talk about it, that is. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Well, I mean, a big risk was moving to box, <laughs> different industry. But that was like for me personally. Um, as a leader, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if there has been any. I mean, quite often at Telefonica, um, I was leading a, a remote team. Um, so we had two offices for our, um, what's it called? Service Performance Management Centre, SPMC. It, essentially, as a knock, it was different branding. Um, we had two offices. One was in um, Buckingham Avenue, which is in Slough, which is where the headquarters are. Um, and the other one was in Harlow, which is where I was based, just down the road from where you are now. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, I led this remote team. We have kind of always fight, fighting a bit of a, a culture where we were kind of out of sight, out of mind, if you like. Um, and there were a few times where I had to disregard what I was being told because I knew that it wasn't in the best interest of my team and go with my gut and just let them do what they were best at. Uh, it's kind of not so much risky for them, but risky for me. Um, but it, it always paid off. Um, I had a very good, very, very, very good supportive team that never let me down. So I didn't see it as a risk. I knew that I was going to potentially get in trouble, but um, and I, I wouldn't advocate for this. Like you should always try and f- follow the line of command. But if you if you really feel strongly that something that you're being asked to do isn't right, then you should go with your heart and your gut and do what is right. And that's what I try to do as much as I can. I um, don't know if that kind of answers your question. No, no, it does. It does. It's interesting because I think some context around that is interesting. If you know, you obviously know yourself very well, and that sounds like... Um, that sounds like an obvious thing to say, but I'd suggest a lot of people don't. And so if you've got enough self-awareness to really understand yourself well in those situations, and also if you're able to play devil's advocate with your own opinion, meaning n- not putting up this straw man argument of your view of why you're right, but actually taking the other side to go, am I right? Are my motives for this decision right? Is it the right thing? Um, and then moving ahead with it, yeah, it makes absolute sense. But you've got to understand yourself quite well because um, we're all pretty good at tricking ourselves into um, <laughs> in, into things. But no, no, it makes perfect sense. So um, f- final question, um, have you um, read any good books this year that you would recommend? Oh, yeah. I mean, you're talking about um, like reading business books. <laughs> it's kind of like what I'm into – and it, I was anyway previously to previous to doing the MBM. But, um, so one that's really good. I, I've got them here. <laughs> this is it's like product placement. Am I allowed to do this? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay. So no rules, rules. Um, so it's the Netflix story. It's a great read. Um, so if you're a fan of candid um, conversation, which I am, um, it's, I think that's like one of the reasons that people trust me is because I am quite authentic and. I say it how it is, and I've kind of built a bit of a brand for myself with that. So you either love it or hate it, but I'll, I'll definitely be straight with you. Um, another one that's really good is Algorithms to Live By. So it's taking like uh, the computer science of human decisions is the subtitle, but essentially, so like, um, how can you do data analytics with your everyday life? Um, bit geeky but it's a good one no 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 i'm re- really i mean i track everything i track my training um i walk around wearing a, a whoop strap um and so i look at like my sleep quality performance i look at my respiratory rate no 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 you've got the right audience here in terms of um, geekiness you're fine <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, I mean, it also talks about like um, there being uh, the, was it the, um, I don't want to kind of butcher this, but so when you're making decisions, there's a, there's like a prime amount of uh, deci- uh, choices that you should look at before you decide on what you want to go for. Read the book. It, it describes it a lot better than that. So. Okay, um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll take a look. <laughs> 11 Rings, Phil Jackson. Okay. Eleven rings. Um, so Phil Jackson, so yeah, eleven-time NBA um, championship coach. Not an NBA fan, but having seen the uh, Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix, became a, a fan of uh, Phil Jackson. Um, just an incredible leader, very authentic as well. A little bit spiritual for my liking, but he definitely he he is very self-aware. Um, but something that resonates with me is that he really gets to understand his his players first. Um, like not just a, like a skill basis, what they can do on the court, but what drives them? What's their motivation for for coming in and playing every day? Like why did they even take up their, their basketball in the first place? Um, and that's something that really resonates for me. Is that's what I like to do with my my engineers. Why are they here? What's their motivations? What makes them tick? What's going on outside of work that could potentially be a factor, but also that I might. It sounds like I'm prying a little bit into their personal life. So we always keep that professional boundaries, but I like to them um, to know that they can trust. For them to know that they can trust me and rely on me, and that goes further than just being a manager. Um, so, I, I I agree. I think there's there's well there's an interesting culture for at the moment. If you were to only look at the internet, there's a lot of nonsense going on around people pretending that all of us are perfect and like virtue signaling and pretending that no one's ever said a bad word in their life and all, all of this nonsense and none of us make mistakes. Um, and they're perhaps the same groups or cohorts that would advocate that you can't mix any kind of professional with personal. I'd suggest you're absolutely right. You can't separate the two. If someone on your team is having an awful time at home and you're not sensitive to that or aware aware enough or, or able to have open like honest dialogue then how are you supposed to help them and it absolutely will impact their performance and there are things that you can do as an organization to support your people better but it does require that you you do have a level of personal intimacy with your team um, so no no i think i think people get overly worried about political correctness these days but i think it's just it'll pass just something going on on the internet at the moment i was just gonna say like and i think of it like in a when you when you look at industries, a cultural thing as well with different companies. Um, so, like, I like to show my vulnerabilities. Um, I think that's what builds empathy amongst others and with your followers. So, um, that wasn't necessarily something that was encouraged at Telefonica. Um, not because they didn't believe in it. It was just that you're a manager. Um, you need to be able to be separate from your engineers, and that's not how I see it at all. Um, so box like it's, it's a very free environment and and actually we're encouraged to show our vulnerabilities as leaders um, because yeah nobody's on a pedestal our ceo will quite happily talk about you know lack of sleep because of being a new father and things like that um, or like the pressures on him um, that come from being a ceo that you might not necessarily think of so uh, yeah it's not something to be shy about i guess is what i'm saying yeah, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? When people, when people do think, oh, well, I'm I'm managing or leading people now, therefore I can't have any faults. It's like, well, you don't. You're still human. You don't change. Of course, you're not perfect at, at everything you do. I agree as well. I'm always pretty open with people about what I am and am not good at. Um, I think, yeah, not just to build empathy. I think it's just it's authentic. Authentic. It's true. It's been human. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think I think when you are when you are almost unapologetically authentic, I think it gives others permission to be so too. And I think that builds really good quality, honest um, foundations for relationships with people. I think anything outside of that. Um, People are smart, a lot smarter than we give them credit for. They sense um, people who are not authentic, and there is elements of they don't fully open up, they don't fully trust. Um, so no, I'm, I'm very much on board with what you're saying about the authenticity and, and, and being yourself. Um, so 
Thank you ever so much. Before we go, actually, I have got one more question. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think I probably should have? That, that is a good question. Um, you've stumped me, Adam. I don't think so. Um, I think you've you've kind of delved into my past and the present and potentials in the future. So I think you've covered most topics. You haven't asked me what football team I support. Um, Do you know what? Partly because I'm a bit embarrassed. So I'm I'm an Englishman, but um, I, I'm not a fan of football at all. So I've got two young nephews who absolutely love it. And the chance are, I probably won't even know who you're talking about, particularly if you start talking about players. But go on then. So who, who do you support? Uh, so um, I, being from Essex, it's my God-given right to be a Manchester United fan, um, you know, 350 miles away. Uh, so <laughs> how, 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 how have they been doing at the moment? This won't mean anything to me, but... <laughs> Well, last night they got knocked out of the Champions League, so not great. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> See, this is why this is why we stem into that, and I knew I was going to put my foot in it. Um, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I'm over it. The last time I knew anything about football was towards the end of Ryan Giggs's career. So Ryan Giggs was playing for Manchester. That's how long ago it was. So what I was probably like. 14, 15, something like that. Oh, well, he only actually retired about ten years ago. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. He must have been really young then. So I'm 36 now. Um, so you're talking about 20 years ago was the last time I, I probably knew anything about football. What happened was I was actually quite good at football when I was a youngster, like much younger. Um, played in a team, really enjoyed it. Um, a, a local side, um, was a captain, played in the fence, really loved it. And then I went through a growth spurt. I guess I was like eight or nine. And um, I just got taller quite quickly. And I don't think my legs were quite caught up. And so suddenly I just seemed to lose all my ability to, to play football. I just absolutely useless all of a sudden. And um, I quickly lost interest because I wasn't any good at it anymore. <laughs> um, probably why I switched off. Um, but yeah, okay. Okay, so um, thank you ever so much. Re really enjoyed having you on the show. Um, re really enjoyed it. Really interesting. Um, really interesting to hear about what Box is doing and, and where you guys are headed. Um, but it will be interesting because it would be nice to have you back on the show and say like a year's time and see how your um, your duty officers and how that structure has scaled with you and if you've made any changes and what it looks like. Um, so, yeah, it would be interesting to have you back on the show and, and see what's what's changed with that. Yeah, come in. It's been awesome. Thank you, Adam. Thanks a lot. Cheers.